hello everyone, and thank you so much for coming to this presentation entitled Ketogenic Diets for Alzheimer's Prevention, subtitle Don't Push the Apple E4 Boulder by me, Nick Norwitz. So first, a little bit of background on me and my disclosures. I received my PhD and my DPhil from the University of Oxford in ketogenics and neurodegenerative diseases. And I, I'm a certified metabolic health practitioner with the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners and I'm pursuing my medical doctorate at Harvard Medical School, the class of 2025. As for my disclosures, my major disclosure for the purposes of this presentation is that I myself am an APOE4 homozygote, which basically means I do have skin in the game with respect to this topic. I'm also on the board of advisors at a company called KetoKind, although I'm unpaid, and I'm co-author on a ketogenic cookbook, the New Mediterranean Diet Cookbook from which I do stand to gain royalties, although I'm committed to sending all of these royalties to nutrition education and research. So without further ado, I want to show you a clip that you may be familiar with um, to help frame what I'm going to talk about. So here's that clip. So aside from hoping that India would get you pumped up from the, for the little adventure we're going to go on, the reason I wanted to show you that boulder rolling down a hill clip is because that's how I think about Alzheimer's disease. I think about Alzheimer's disease as a boulder rolling down the hill. And once the boulder gets rolling, there's really little you can do to stop it. No matter how hard you try, maybe you can slow the boulder. Um, but to stop it is pretty ambitious and to push it back up the hill is almost impossible. So really the goal for Alzheimer's disease, the holy grail prevention is to not push the boulder down the hill in the first place. So the next question are, what are the boulder pushers? What are the things we want to address so that we don't push the boulder down the hill so that we don't start the vicious set, uh, the vicious cycles that precipitate Alzheimer's disease? Well, not surprisingly, those are metabolic factors and lifestyle factors. Those are the things we want to address. And specifically, I'm going to be talking about nutrition and ketogenics. But just a little bit more in terms of framing statistics. Currently, there are about 5 million cases of Alzheimer's disease in the United States. And um, case you know, prevalence is on the rise. By mid-century, that number could as much as triple to 14 million cases in the United States alone. And in parallel with that, is uh, an increase in the economic burden of Alzheimer's disease. So right now we're spending a billion dollars per day on Alzheimer's disease and diabetes each actually. But by mid-century, we could be spending 1.1 trillion per year or $3 billion per day on Alzheimer's disease, which is an unsustainable economic burden. So even setting aside the unimaginable human burden, it's unsustainable economically. We need to address this. In terms of what population is most important, well, Although only 20 to 25% of people, which is not a small amount, carry APOE4, um, 40 to 65% of people, of patients with Alzheimer's disease are APOE4 positive. So if we could reduce risk in this population, it would have a massive effect on um, overall prevalence of Alzheimer's disease. I would argue, perhaps selfishly, that APOE4 is the population we really want to focus on when it comes to um, risk reduction in Alzheimer's disease. As for how much APOE4 increases risk, well, on the population level, APOE4 increases risk two to threefold if you have one copy and um, as much as 15-fold, 12 to 15-fold, by some estimates if you have two copies. And these patterns, they hold on a global level as well, as you can see here. 
just a little bit more background. What is ApoE, ApoE4? Well, ApoE, it's a gene and a protein. The ApoE gene codes for the ApoE lipoprotein, which you can show here. It's lipidated. It's bound to um, lipids. And in ApoE4, which is one of three forms of ApoE, this cysteine is modified to an arginine. And what that causes is a pinching of the ApoE4. So there's a domain interaction. The ApoE4 um, domains interact, and this changes structure, it changes function, and therefore, on the population level, increases Alzheimer's risk by three to 15 fold. But, and this is really important, that relationship, that increased risk with ApoE4 does not hold across the globe. So for example, in Nigerians, there are, um, individuals or, or populations in which Alzheimer's, ApoE4 does not prefer an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. So in this study, 20.5% um, of control subjects um, who did not have any dementia had ApoE4, whereas around 17% of patients with AD, Alzheimer's disease, had ApoE4. So that's actually a lower number, although it wasn't actually statistically significant, suggesting in this population, ApoE4 is not associated with increased Alzheimer's risk. Now, you could just brush this off as a weird genetic linkage thing, but that seems unlikely because if you look at um, comparative populations with similar genetic backgrounds, as they did in the um, Indianapolis Abedin study, they find that individuals of African descent, so similar genetic backgrounds, if they lived in Africa, in Western Africa, the um, increased uh, prevalence of Alzheimer's disease, the increased uh, incidence over you know, a certain time frame, was half as much as Africans living in America. So you can see in the African American population, new cases of Alzheimer's disease over a certain time frame were 2.52% of persons, and in the African population, it was only 1.15% corrected for um, age, suggesting that again. Um, in people living in Western Africa, because presumably of lifestyle factors, ApoE4 is not associated with increased Alzheimer's risk. So takeaway, lifestyle matters. Lifestyle is in part mediating the effect of um, ApoE4 on Alzheimer's disease. And this isn't the only epidemiological data that suggests this. You can look at other populations like uh, Mediterranean populations, and you see the same thing. So in carriers of ApoE4 who are Southern Italian, so again, same genetic background, if they live in Southern Italy, they have an odds ratio of 1.21 of leaving into extreme old age, which is actually above one, so presumably good. Um, extreme old age being above 99 years old for women and above 95 for men, which suggests a life without Alzheimer's because once you get diagnosed, your median survival with Alzheimer's is only three to six years. So if you have ApoE4, and you're Southern Italian, and you're living in Southern Italy, you have a great chance of living a long, healthy life. But if you're ApoE4 and Southern Italian, and you move to the United States, or you live in the United States, you are much more likely to die early or not live to be in the extreme old age. So again, all things being equal, if people lived in the United States and had ApoE4, extreme longevity was 71% less likely. Odds ratio 0 0.29 in the United States versus 1.21 in Southern Italy, which is pretty astonishing. And this coupled with, um, you know, the Nigerian study and RCTs that I'm not going to show, but in older populations, basically show us or confirm ApoE4, it is not a causative uh, genetic variant. There are a few that contribute to about 5% of cases of Alzheimer's disease, APP, P1, and P2, but the vast majority of cases of Alzheimer's disease are not caused by genetics. However, ApoE4 is a risk allele. It does not cause, it does not cause Alzheimer's disease, but it interacts with lifestyle factors, bolder pushers, as I'll introduce, to precipitate Alzheimer's disease. So returning to the bolder pusher analogy, ApoE3, it's kind of the baseline risk. We have these metabolic factors, these lifestyle factors that are boulder pushers. How is the situation different in ApoE4? Well, you still have the same boulder pushers in ApoE4, except some of them are amplified, and there might be other boulder pushers. Getting the boulder closer to the edge in ApoE4, meaning you have a little bit less wiggle room. So another way to phrase this is... Um, 
you're probably going to hear that number. 88% of people are metabolic unhealthy. I'm sure over the course of this conference, somebody's going to say that. Well, if you're in the 88% and you have Apple E3, maybe you can get away with it. But you have a lot less wiggle room. You're pretty close to the edge when you have Apple E4. You cannot get away with being in the 88%. Basically, you really need to focus on these boulder pushers, on neutralizing them so you don't push the boulder down the hill so you can prevent Alzheimer's disease. That's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about these extra boulder pushers. And fortunately and excitingly, there is so much new cool data coming out in top journals like Cell, Science, and Nature just in the past couple of years. And talking about the metabolic how of Alzheimer's disease, how ApoE4, this lipoprotein, this metabolism modifying protein increases Alzheimer's risk, again, by modifying metabolism. So if you get nothing out of what I'm about to say, because I'm going to bounce around, I'm going to say some things that might go over some people's heads. Um, I hope you just get from this my level of enthusiasm and optimism, because the trajectory we see with Alzheimer's disease is so disheartening. And yet when you start to look at the data just in the past couple of years, this is becoming an area of intense interest and in the amount of data that's just come out in a short period of time is giving us so much more information about, again, the metabolic how of Alzheimer's disease. And I think that is the basis to generating, you know, bottom up mechanism informed prevention approaches, which is kind of what I'm going to be talking, talking about that little, well, you'll see. So again, scope, I'm going to be talking about mechanism, new science in top journals and prevention, neutralizing the boulder pushers. I'm not going to be talking about symptomatic relief. There's a lot of data on that. That is the stronger data, but those are the data that, that have been talked about and I'm not going to go after. So just as a case in point, though, this was a study published again this year because so much more data is coming out showing a ketogenic diet significantly improved in Alzheimer's disease, activities of daily living and quality of life and with a trend towards improvement in cognition um, as compared to a low fat diet. So this is the Phillips et al study, you can look that up. But what I'm gonna be talking about is prevention, the boulder pushers. With that said, you know, I wanna give a four hour presentation on this. At some point I probably will and record it. Right now I'm gonna be talking about the tip of the iceberg. There is so much more. This is all related to Alzheimer's disease and metabolism from papers I've published on it. Um, and I'm just going to be bouncing around, but just know there is, there is so much data coming out on Apple E4. In fact, there was a paper this year on Apple E4 and, and uh, how it interacts with COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2. So we can talk about that in the Q and A if you're interested, but I, I think it's such an interesting and exploding area. So um, one more thing I'll say before I jump into the boulder bushes, I promise this is the last thing is again, I'm going to be jumping around a lot and not, going over all the data that back the models I'm going to show. So it's going to seem more speculative than I think it actually is. I think there is actually more support. That said, I lay out a lot of the logic behind what I share in this paper, which was published in Nutrients um, a couple months ago in April, where we talk about precision nutrition for um, Alzheimer's prevention in Apple E4. This is like microglia, astrocytes, neurons, parasites, blood brain barrier and stuff. Um, I did this in collaboration with the Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic at Cornell. So um, if I start losing you and you just want to, you know, go on mute and go do something else while I, I, I bore everybody else, I won't know the difference. And you can read this paper later. With that said, I do want to get into some of the mechanisms. So to start. First boulder pusher is blood brain barrier dysfunction. And to talk about blood brain barrier dysfunction, I want to talk about this paper that was published in Nature uh, in 2020. It's actually one of my favorite studies of the past couple of years by Montagni et al. And what they did in this study it was a human study. They took 245 people and they subjected them to um, uh, a DCE MRI to look at blood brain barrier breakdown and amyloid and tau levels. So amyloid and tau are the basic pathologies associated with Alzheimer's disease. Those are the two you really think about when you think Alzheimer's disease. And what they found interestingly was that even in, even precognitive impairments so clinical dementia rating score is zero, in ApoE4 carriers, there was an increase in blood brain barrier breakdown. You can see that here and quantified here 
an increase in blood brain barrier breakdown independent of amyloid tau pathologies. That's really interesting. Blood brain barrier breakdown was elevated in apple leaf forest independent of amyloid and tau. Now, the important question we should ask is, is this clinically meaningful? Well, it turns out, yeah, it is. So what they did next is they broke people down um, into baseline groups based on the degree to which they have blood brain barrier breakdown. They measured this by a cerebral spinal fluid marker, um, soluble platelet drive growth factor beta. But basically, they took individuals with um, high blood brain barrier breakdown marker uh, and low blood brain barrier breakdown marker. So high blood brain barrier breakdown was blue and low blood brain barrier breakdown was gray. And they tracked them for 2.5 to 4.5 years over time. And what they found was that increased blood brain barrier breakdown at baseline predicted cognitive decline on a mental status exam, specifically in Apple V4 carriers. And again, independent of amyloid and tau pathologies. And what this is telling us is it's showing us Blood brain barrier breakdown is a novel and independent boulder pusher in ApoE4 carriers that contributes to cognitive decline, a whole new pathway, which is really interesting. The next thing we want to know is, you know, what is the mechanism behind this pathway? And there are transgenic mice, mouse data that inform this. So this is a paper that went hand in hand with that Montagne paper. This is by Bell et al., also in Nature. And what they showed using ApoE4 transgenic mice is this is the pathway that contributes to blood-brain barrier breakdown. So um, ApoE4, it's unable to inhibit this protein LRP1, which I'm going to talk about a lot, so remember it, LRP1, which leads to elevated um, uh, levels of this protein CYPA, elevated NF-kappa B, or in inflammatory transcription factor activity, and increased expression of this protein MMP9. MMP9 is a gelatinase enzyme that breaks down the blood brain barrier. So what they also found in this paper is inhibiting any component of the pathway, inhibiting CYPA, NF-kappa B, or MMP9 was sufficient to protect against blood brain barrier breakdown and protect against cognitive decline. So the next question we want to ask is how? How could we inhibit you know, the activity of this pathway? Because that predicts a protection against blood brain barrier breakdown. ketogenic diet. So this study shows a ketogenic diet in mice can significantly reduce MMP9 expression. Now, I do want to admit, caveat, big caveat here, this particular study was a mouse model of colon cancer. I'm choosing it just because it provides the most illustrative graph um, for a time-restricted presentation. But um, it's, I think, pretty plausible to suggest that ketogenic diets would generally decrease MMP9 activity, not just because of these data showing a ketogenic diet does decrease MMP9 activity, but also because the pathway was um, HDAC mediated, NF-kappa B mediated, and we have other data suggesting that ketogenic diets are anti-inflammatory, they're HDAC inhibitors, and they um, quiet inflammation and NF-kappa B activity. So there's a good reason to believe ketogenic diets could you know, inhibit MP9 expression and protect against the blood brain barrier. So it seems plausible that a ketogenic diet could neutralize this new boulder pusher that came out of this 2020 data, protecting the brain against cognitive decline in Apple E4 carriers. That's pretty exciting. Moving on, I want to talk about endosomal dysfunction. And I'm actually going to use LRP1 from this last paper as a bridge, just because all of these things are interrelated. So um, LRP1, I said I talked about it a lot. It's a receptor. It inhibits this pathway. And like a lot of receptors and uh, transporters on cell surfaces, it gets recycled through endosomes. So uh, endosomes are organelles. They, you know, there's an endocytosis, the receptor, the LRP1 that ends up in the endosome. And then, you know, it can be transported to lysosomes, drop things off for degradation or be recycled back to the top uh, or the cell membrane. And when there's dysfunctional endosomal recycling, you can have um, lower levels of surface membrane proteins like LRP1 or others, like insulin receptor, which I'll talk about later. So in this study um, by Prasad et al. and PNAS, they looked uh, uh, again at human brain. So uh, they did a post-mortem analysis from a large microarray data set. And what they found was that in the Apple E4 brain, there is a downregulation of this protein here, NHE6. 
And NH6 is an endosomal protein that leaks protons. And because it would leak protons, it would decrease the acidity um, of you know, endosomes. And so that suggests in an ApoE4 context, ApoE4 endosomes are going to be more acidic or lower pH. And that's exactly what we find. So in these, um, this was uh, astrocytes from ApoE3 or ApoE4 transgenic mice. Uh, ApoE4 increases acidity or decreases pH of endosomes. And what this does is causes endosomal dysfunction, trapping receptors like LRP1 inside the cell. So you can see surface LRP1 levels are decreased. And that leads to dysfunctions that can contribute to Alzheimer's disease. So the one they looked at in this paper was amyloid clearance. LRP1 helps clear out amyloid from the brain. And as you can see, a decreased level of NHC6 contributes to acidification of endosomes, decreased LRP1 levels, and decreased amyloid clearance in ApoE4. Again, the takeaway, ApoE4 leads to endosomal acidification and the entrapment of LRP1 receptor leading to impaired amyloid clearance. And again, these things are related. LRP1 inhibits this pathway. So you might have more activation of the blood brain barrier degrading pathway. Moving on, how is this effect mediated? How does ApoE4 protein contribute to uh, changes in NHE6 and endosomal dysfunction? Well, it has to do with histone deacetylases. So you can see very clearly here from the same paper is that uh, histone deacetylase 4, which modifies gene expression and increases NHC6, uh, or sorry, decreases NHC6 expression, is much more active in ApoE4. So you can see here the blue is uh, the nuclei, the DAP stain, and in ApoE4, you have a lot more HDAC4 translocation to the nuclei, more HDAC4 activity. So what you want to do is inhibit HDAC4. How do you do that? Well, you can do that with HDAC4 inhibitors, obviously. So um, here, sorry, it's a little small. small. This is NHE6 expression. This red column is ApoE3. This blue column is ApoE4. And here are the broad spectrum HDAC4 inhibitors. And what's showing is that they recover NHE6 levels to res restore endosome function. The ones they focus on were TSA and um, SHAA. But I want to point out this column here. This is SBUT, sodium butyrate. Sodium butyrate or beta hydroxybutyrate, they're also HDAC inhibitors, HDAC4 inhibitors, which I can show you here. So butyrate is very similar to beta hydroxybutyrate. And both butyrate and beta hydroxybutyrate, they have the same HDAC inhibiting activity as the other HDAC inhibitors as you can see here. So the data in this study might be, you know, relatable to ketones. And I'll show you data to support that, but what do they find? Well, when you have an HDAC inhibitor, TSA or SHAA, um, SH, SAHA, sorry, I'm very dyslexic today. Um, they found that, you know, HDAC inhibition it restores endosome um, pH, reduces acidity, restores surface LRP1 levels and restores LRP1 function, and in this case, amyloid clearance. So, you know, I'm, I'm putting a lot of pieces of the puzzle together. I was predicting to you, okay, you know, because ketones are also HDAC inhibitors, they should also restore endosomal function and restore LRP1 levels. That's a lot of leaps of faith, right? That said, you know, if you go into the literature, again, new literature just from 2020 and ask the question, does BHB also restore, um, say, LRP1 levels? Well, it turns out, yeah, yeah, it does. So in this, um, this is an in vitro blood brain barrier model, brain-like endothelial cells or BLEX. They showed that, you know, just like TSA and SHA restore um, LRP1 levels, ketones, BHB, restores LRP1 levels. Thus, HDAC inhibition and beta hydroxybutyrate, they both restore LRP1 levels. And this can help restore amyloid clearance and endosomal function. But this is only the tip of the iceberg. Because while I focused on LRP1 as a case in point, endosomal function, it's a core pathology of Alzheimer's disease. So other proteins like ABCA1, which is involved in ApoE lipidation, insulin receptor, which is involved in cerebral insulin 
resistance, they're also trapped in endosomes. Uh, and this is associated with APOE4. I'll talk a little bit about insulin receptor later. So the endosome entrapment model can explain increased blood-brain barrier breakdown, um, altered amyloid efflux and increased plaques, changes in um, lipid function, dysfunctional lipid transport, lipotoxicity, and cerebral insulin resistance. I think that um, the, the endosome model is one area ripe for exploration where we'll see more research in the coming years. But what we do know is that consistent with, you know, the model I put forth, ketones can restore at least LRP1 levels. So it's a hypothesis. There's actually more data too to support this hypothesis. Again, this is all just from the last couple of years. So um, I'll, I'll kind of go through this quickly because I, I'm a little bit rambly, but let's take this protein, for example, PICOM. So PICOM, which stands for phosphatidyl inositol binding clathrin assembly protein, it's a master regulator of endosome function. PICOM influences endosome function and PICOM um, mutations are actually themselves associated with Alzheimer's disease. And functionally, PICOM is related to receptors that get cycled through endosomes like uh, LRP1. So people have speculated that a core defect in PICOM um, can cause endosome dysfunction and this is associated with Alzheimer's disease. And so what in this paper they did is using uh, human iPSC-derived astrocytes, they found that increasing PICOM expression completely rescued endocytic dysfunction in ApoE4, which is pretty exciting. These results suggest that increasing um, PICOM dose uncouples the presence of ApoE4 from its detrimental effects on endocytosis. How does this relate to ketones? Well, maybe ketones can, you know, they increase a lot of P1, would they increase PICOM? which would predict improved endosomal function? Heck yeah. So in this paper, ketone bodies significantly enhance protein levels of LRP1, um, P, uh, GP, which are again, cycled through endosomes and PICOM, um, described to be involved in amyloid clearance. So again, what we see here is that ketones increase levels of a master regulator of endocytosis, which is dysfunctional in ApoE4. Summing it up in just this little model, it's theoretically possible that ketogenic diets could increase PICOM levels to help restore um, endosome function in the ApoE4 context, restoring LRP1 levels, PGP levels, ABCA1 levels, and insulin receptor levels, and more. So another bolder pusher in the books. It's feasible that ketogenic diets can help restore endosomal functions in ApoE4 carriers, which is pretty cool. Moving on. Uh, a favorite topic, I think, of some of the people listening, let, listen. we'll talk about cholesterol and energy metabolism. So this is a cool paper that came out this year in, in Cell Press and Neuron. Um, it was in vitro data and uh, ApoE4 transgenic mice about cholesterol metabolism, which is hot in the keto sphere, and energy and microRNAs, weirdly enough. So for those of you who don't know, microRNAs are no, small non-coding RNAs that inhibit mRNA translation into protein. So they inhibit protein expression at the translational level. This paper was quite complicated, but I want to bring it down to earth a little bit by uh, building on Dave Feldman's lipid energy model. So if you guys aren't familiar with this lipid energy model, that's a shame. You need to learn more about it. That is a, uh, a request from me, please, because it's so cool. And I love Dave. But Dave, um, you know, proposes this energy model that boats in the bloodstream, whereby um, ApoB particles, specifically the LDL lineage, the VLDL, LDL lineage, functions to transport triglycerides, little um, lightning bolts, and cholesterol from the liver to peripheral uh, organs around the body as a form of you know, energy transport. So the triglycerides are the energy and the cholesterol is coming along for the ride. In analogy to that, I want to talk about not ApoB you know, LDL as boats in the bloodstream, but ApoE lipid particles as boats in the brain. So like LDL particles, ApoE particles carry cholesterol. That's the plus side in Dave's model, and that's the plus sign in my model. Here's cholesterol. ApoE particles carry cholesterol around the brain. They also carry microRNAs. Now, what are the microRNAs doing? So 
Um, well, I guess first question, where is Apple Week carrying its cargo from and to? Well, astrocytes or support cells in the brain, they're the main producers of ApoE and they're the main producers of cholesterol. They're the thing that produce most cholesterol for neurons. So um, astrocytes produce ApoE um, containing lipoprotein particles that contain within them cholesterol and microRNAs and ship them over to neurons. So we know the cholesterol is being delivered to neurons to be incorporated into membranes. What are the microRNAs doing? The microRNAs are actually inhibiting cholesterol synthesis at the trans, uh, by inhibiting the expression of um, cholesterol producing enzymes at the translational level. So this is a figure from the paper and each blue square is a different microRNA inhibiting that protein's expression. So this is the rate limiting enzyme, HMG CoA reductase, and you can see all the microRNAs that target it for decreased expression. And now I do want to emphasize here, this is not decreasing brain cholesterol production overall, but shifting the burden of cholesterol synthesis from neurons to astrocytes. And thinking energetically, this makes a lot of sense. Why would it make sense to shift the burden from neurons to astrocytes? Well, one, you know, cholesterol synthesis, it's a very energetically expensive process. So it makes sense to try to relieve the metabolic demand on neurons so neurons can do other things like express memory genes. In addition, acetyl-CoA is a precursor to cholesterol. So de novo um, neural synthesis would deplete a Krebs cycle, a TCA cycle substrate, which is needed to produce energy. Also, acetyl-CoA is needed to uh, acetylate histones and alter uh, gene expression or increase gene expression. And these aren't just things I'm coming up with randomly. This was in the paper and supports the model that I'm going to show you. But the bottom line I'm trying to express with this slide is it makes energetic and adaptive sense to shift the burden, not reduce cholesterol synthesis, but shift it from neurons to astrocytes. So astrocytes, they send, um, I'm first starting with ApoE3. So this is baseline. This is what should be happening. That ApoE3 particles uh, or ApoE, ApoE particles, they carry the cholesterol and the microRNAs to neurons. In carrying the microRNAs, those microRNAs, as we know, they decrease cholesterol synthesis enzymes. And you can see that here. So like HMG-CoA reductase, when you have the, um, the microRNAs, you decrease the cholesterol synthesis enzymes. This leads to an increase in the acetyl-CoA pool, as I alluded to, leading to an increase in histone acetylation. And you can see that here. Here's histone acetylation. And an increase in memory gene expression. So again, ApoE particles, they deliver microRNAs, supplying cholesterol, which neurons need. Relieving the cholesterol synthesis burden on neurons, you can increase the acetyl-CoA pool. You also have more energy. You can increase histone acetylation, and you can increase memory gene expression. How does this situation differ in an ApoE4 context? Well, in ApoE4, ApoE4 um, actually delivers less cholesterol for whatever reason. I don't even know why, but it, ApoE4 particles, they deliver less cholesterol. And so it also makes sense that they're not going to want to inhibit cholesterol synthesis as much because the neurons still need cholesterol. So they deliver fewer microRNAs. And you can see that here. ApoE delivers fewer microRNAs and less cholesterol, leading to a smaller decrease in so cholesterol synthesis enzymes. So fewer microRNAs in ApoE4. This is ApoE4 versus ApoE3 ratioed. And then a smaller decrease. So this column is ApoE3. This column is ApoE4. So a smaller decrease in the ApoE4 context, meaning that there's going to be a depletion of the acetyl-CoA pool, meaning there's going to be less histone acetylation, meaning there's going to be worse expression of memory genes in an ApoE4 context. How does this relate to ketones, or specifically the ketone body beta-hydroxybutyrate? Well, if you think mechanistically, beta-hydroxybutyrate is perfectly situated to address all the nodes in this pathway. So, for example, BHB can, we talked about how we show data showing it can improve LRP1 levels. And LRP1 is actually the thing that helps mRNAs get delivered to neurons. So although there might be fewer microRNAs, it can help the efficiency of delivery of the microRNAs are there. So that helps. It also is a direct um, precursor for acetyl-CoA. It has been shown in studies to boost the acetyl-CoA pool. So it could, you know, intervene at this stage of the pathway, providing more substrate for histone acetylation. And it's an HDAC inhibitor, further increasing histone, histone 
um, HDAC activity and increasing histone acetylation to promote membrane expression. And it's an energy substrate. So even though the energy burden on neurons might not have been relieved as much, it gets more energy now for BHP. So there's lots of different ways that ketones could affect this pathway. Again, this is speculation, but this is 2021 data. Um, so, you know, maybe I'm, I'm laying out some areas of exploration, but again, these mechanisms are plausible and they're very interesting. So that's one more boulder pusher in the books. One more way a ketogenic diet could help prevent Alzheimer's disease by neutralizing a specific boulder pusher in ApoE4. Next boulder pusher, vascular defects. This was also 21, 21 data and um, in neuron, so cell press by Yamazaki et al. And this is an interesting paper because they did an ApoE4 transgenic mouse model, but a conditional expression model. So they only expressed ApoE4 or ApoE3 in vascular mural cells. So they would be only affecting vascular function. What did they find? Well, there was decreased cerebral blood flow, no surprise. And this was sufficient to cause a decrease in long-term potentiation, which is uh, a, the basis of memory, and a change in behavior. So these data are showing that vascular defects associated with ApoE4 are sufficient to, you know, really contribute or cause in this model um, features of impaired memory and behavioral manifestations that would be associated with Alzheimer's disease. And this is a whole field or subfield that's being explored. Sydney Strickland or Rockefeller is really the big name in this field, talking about how vascular defects are a core early pathology of Alzheimer's disease. Some people think there are always vascular defects in Alzheimer's disease, and there's a lot of overlap between vascular dementias and Alzheimer's disease. And it's interesting to look at some of the trials for addressing Alzheimer's symptoms or slowing disease progression, um, because they inevitably have really high rates of hypertension. So 70% hypertension in this trial, which is not cherry picked, just I, I went for the finger trial because it was one that I had on hand. That's ridiculous, 70% hypertension. Now, it's no surprise, I think, to anybody listening here that our society is basically structured for vascular dysfunction. If you think about the way we eat, the high glycemic carbs contribute to insulin resistance along with the snack and also insulin resistance. You know, that decreases nitric oxide levels, which impairs vascular function, also the high fructose corn syrup. You know, the fructose generates uric acid, also decreases nitric oxide, more vascular dysfunction, it's high glycemic carb, it gets glucose excursions causing endothelial damage and round and round and round, sedentary lifestyle, stress, cortisol, all these things. And to address vascular dysfunction, I mean, really it's a, again, holistic lifestyle intervention, but we do have pretty good data suggesting low carb, low, clean, low carb diets can improve vascular function. I won't carry the burden of talking about all of that, but if you're interested in that topic, I'd refer you to some of the work by uh, Dr. David Unwin. Another one of my role models, I remember listening to a presentation by him this past summer where he was looking at um, uh, low-carb diets and diabetes and showed that low-carb diets were about twice as effective as SGLT2 inhibitors for hypertension and diabetics, which is pretty cool in my opinion. So one more boulder pusher you know, clean, low-carb diets, or a lot of interventions, to be perfectly honest, could address vascular defects that underlie Alzheimer's disease, and in particular in an ApoE4 context where the gene itself or the gene variant can exacerbate vascular defects. Again, you got less wiggle room if you're ApoE4. Moving on, um, microglia. So microglia are the resident immune cells in the brain, inflammatory cells. Um, that contribute to Alzheimer's disease. Inflammation in the brain contributes to Alzheimer's disease. And I want to relate this to the standard amyloid cascade hypothesis, which you probably all know about, in which um, Alzheimer's amyloid contributes to neurofibrillary tau tangles. These are the two main pathologies associated with Alzheimer's. But there's a lot of question of what links amyloid to tau. And one of the things that links amyloid to tau, there are several, is microglia, these inflammatory immune cells in the brain, and specifically NLRP3 inflammasome act activation in microglia. So what you see here in this graph, this is from um, uh, Alzheimer's disease mouse model. And what you see here on the y-axis is um, AT8, it's a marker of phosphorylated tau. So this, 
And this APP mouse model is going to have increased amyloid. But what you find is if you knock out the NLRP3 inflammasome, it neutralizes the effect. So there's no linkage between amyloid and tau, suggesting that you know, microglia and NLRP3 inflammasome activation help link amyloid to tau, which contributes to um, neuronal dysfunction. And no surprise, ApoE4 can kind of exacerbate this, push the boulder closer to the edge. Um, where ApoE4 makes microglia more inflammatory. It can help activate microglial um, NLRP3 activity. So the goal should be to help, you know, decrease inflammation in the brain, which you can do through a clean keto diet, but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, this is just data from, this is human data from the Freiburg study that was the opening slide of this boulder section. So in this study, they took 154 um, autopsy brains, actually from the Framingham heart study population. And they were looking at activated microglia. This is uh, IBA1, a microglia marker, and associating with tau, pathology, with tau pathologies. And what they found was that specifically in ApoE4 people, the red line, there was a, a correlation between microglial activity and tau pathologies. There was a trend, it looks like, in the ApoE4 negatives. It was much stronger and positive, suggesting a goal, maybe it, probably in everybody, but specifically in ApoE4 carriers, at least should be to quiet microglia, calm them down, decrease inflammation by inhibiting the NLRP3 inflammasome. And as many of you may know from the famous 2015 Umidol data, ketones inhibit NLRP3, but I'm not gonna show that data, probably because a lot of you have seen it. Instead, show new data from Shippy et al. And this was a brain model, uh, Alzheimer's model of Alzheimer's disease, sorry, a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease I think all Alzheimer's models of Alzheimer's disease are Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> and what they found is that BHB ketones inhibit NLRP3. So you can see here also, BHB in the um, amyloid mouse model decreased microglial activity. And this, again, new data from 2020. This is again saying ketones probably or plausibly can neutralize a boulder pusher in ApoE4 which is cool. Now, the moment a lot of you have probably all been waiting for insulin resistance and insulin receptor. So um, this is the oldest study I think I'm actually showing, which is saying something because it's a 2017 study, but it was published in Neuron and Cell Press. It's a great study by Zhao et al. It was an ApoE4 transgenic mouse model looking at insulin signaling. What it showed was that um, ApoE4 traps insulin receptor, let's see here, inside cells um, because it creates endosomal dysfunction, tying back into the beginning. So um, just as a review, this is the insulin signaling cascade where insulin binds to receptor tyrosine kinase, activates insulin receptor substrate, PHPK, PDK1, AKT. But I want to focus on this protein which you might not heard of as much about GSK3 beta, glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta, named because it phosphorylates glycogen synthase and changes uh, uh, glycogen storage. But this protein, in my opinion, uh, its name underrepresents its importance, especially in the brain. So GSK3 beta is really important in the development of uh, Alzheimer's pathologies. So both amyloid and tau pathologies, GSK3 beta, it changes... Um, how amyloid precursor protein is cleaved, promoting um, toxic amyloid elimer uh, production. Um, it also can help increase levels of base one beta secretase, um, which helps again produce toxic amyloids. And another name for GSK3 beta is tau kinase one, because it's one of the principal tau kinases that phosphorylates tau, making hyperphosphorylated tau neurofibrillary tangles. Again, bottom line, GSK3 beta contributes to the major pathologies associated with Alzheimer's disease. And just because it's such a bad guy in the brain, I'm now stereotyping it, uh, I had to throw it on a little subtle joke. And one of the papers I published, I don't know if this looks like anything or anybody to you. I don't know if we have any Game of Thrones fans but I couldn't help it. <laughs> anyway, maybe that joke was lost on some people. I hope some people got it. If you get it, I love you. <laughs> um, more to the point. What they showed in this study 
was that uh, in the Apple E4 context, mice were much more vulnerable to um, increased GSK3 beta activity, insulin resistance, uh, induced by an obesogenic diet. So you can see here high fat diet, which is a high fat, high sugar diet, caused PSK, uh, PGSK3 beta over GSK3 beta is inhibition of the, this protein. So lower levels mean less inhibition, more activity. And we can see that, that in the um, Apple E4 mice, but not the Apple E3 mice, the obesogenic diet, the like, standard American type diet for mice, um, led to a decreased inhibition of GSK3 beta, meaning that you're going to get more amyloid and more tau. So just summing it up in a little graphic, more social media rep or media references, a you know trash diet like sucrose, sucrose lodex, which is a carb, lard and soybean oil, like it's like pork rinds and coke for mice, um, contributes to insulin resistance, the activation of GSK3 beta, um, and then amyloid and tau pathologies and Alzheimer's disease. There's a lot more I could say on insulin resistance in the brain um, in Apple E4. It's just such a wide topic. I'm just gonna throw some things out there. Um, HOMA IR score, so higher indicating more insulin resistance, leads to decreased or is directly correlated with decreased cerebral glucose metabolism. Um, and also increased uh, insulin resistance is associated with worse um, cognitive functions. Hyperinsulinemia, uh, which goes, it goes hand in hand with insulin resistance. So if you're insulin resistant, you're going to have high insulin levels and insulin competitively inhibits this protein here, insulin degrading enzyme, which degrades amyloid. So insulin degrading enzyme, it degrades amyloid and insulin, but if you're insulin resistant, there's more insulin and it competes with the enzyme. So less amyloid that gets degraded, which then starts a vicious cycle leading to more GSK3 beta activation, also more insulin resistance and spiraling down. This is the part of the path where the boulder is rolling down the hill and you get a vicious cycle. So let's not push the boulder. Furthermore, if you're eating a diet rich in sugars, you're going to get more advanced glycation end products. And Apple E4, it binds advanced glycation end products much better, about threefold better than Apple E3. Again, Apple E4, it exacerbates the damage of unhealthy lifestyle choices. So it's unhealthy for everybody, but Apple E4 just multiplies that effect. How do we address insulin resistance or prevent it? Well, we know what effects you know, a clean, low-carb diet can have. For a lot of people, it can put insulin resistance in the grave. Um, anyway, that was a lot. Just summing up, coming back to this model, this boulder down a hill model. The goal is not to push the boulder down the hill. Don't be indie running. Um, and what we found through exploring the mechanisms, and I don't have clinical data on this, in part because, you know, we're never going to do these 20, 30-year clinical trials that need to be done. But also, I specifically chose to focus on new data coming out in 2020 and 2021. So this is all new. I'm just trying to set up a framework for why this makes sense mechanistically. Um, and what we found is that clean ketogenic diets, they can potentially protect against the pushers of blood brain barrier dysfunction and disomal dysfunction related to LRP1, ABCA1, which I didn't even get to talk about insulin receptor improve cholesterol and energy metabolism. That was that model with Dave's boats in the bloodstream and my brain in the bloodstream or um, boats in the brain. Vascular defects, activated microglia, calming neural inflammation, improving or protecting against insulin resistance. It's all very interesting and very plausible. Now, very obviously, what I provided here is speculation. I 100% admit that. But what are like, what are our options for true prevention? Because there are no, no true prevention trials, nor do I think will there ever be for a disease that starts decades before symptoms manifest. You know, epidemiology just shows us that um, lifestyle factors will be protective. It doesn't tell us which we should actually implement, especially with respect to nutrition. It doesn't allow us to draw conclusions about what to eat. So all we really have with respect to prevention and nutrition is informed speculation. And for people like myself, living at high risk for Alzheimer's disease, people across the lifespan from this baby to this man, 
Um, mechanism inform speculation. And these will be my last words. Mechanism inform speculation. It is speculation, but it's far better than just a shrug. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Nick. Paul, look, APOE4 has almost been a death sentence uh, previously, but it's clearly not, uh, you know, not that way. No, and what I often say is that genetics is not fate. And while we do know that for the average person leading the average lifestyle, carrying APOE4 can increase your risk of Alzheimer's disease and dementia, it doesn't have to be like that. And Nick just presented two very neat studies. So one of my favourite ones is when they took a, a, a group of uh, ethnic Nigerians living in the city of Indianapolis and they compared them to an identically similar group of Nigerians living in a city called Inbadan. And these two cities were historically linked by the slave trade. And they had the same rate of APOE4 carriage. And incidentally, it's the highest rate of APOE4 carriage of any population in the world. And they found that the population living in Nigeria had two and a half times less risk of Alzheimer's disease. So it really goes to show the impact of lifestyle. So, And in Southern Italy study, they actually found that if they had a ethnic Southern Italians living in Italy, they had a very good chance of living to a ripe old age, what they call extreme old age. But if they're living in a similar city in America with poorer metabolic health, as we know that, uh, you know, of U.S. adults, only about 12% of U.S. adults are actually metabolically healthy, um, then their chances of living to a ripe old age were way down. So I guess the key, the key thing to remember is that if you do have APOE4, um, it's not a death sentence. It doesn't necessarily consign you to developing uh, dementia, but it is really, really important that you take care of your metabolic health. It's more important for you than for most people.